Have you ever been to a Cracker Barrel? Because there's really nothing like it, and as long as that's said in a positive way, that's a good sign for the business. It's definitely more of a southern thing, but they're located all over the US. Here's the location finder on their website. As of September of 2018, there's 655 of them in 46 states. I found generally, if you click on what's considered more of a southern state, like Georgia, you get more locations than if you try somewhere else. Like, for example, California only has two, they actually only got their first locations there last year, but it's not a perfect rule. I would actually view the whole concept of this place a little confusing if I didn't already know about it. For anyone watching this that's unfamiliar with Cracker Barrel, here's a picture of one. I think we can all agree it's representative of a typical location. What do you think this looks like? I mean, it has to look like a store, right? Not a restaurant? It says store. Well, it's both, but mainly a restaurant. They're really relying on you already knowing this. The store portion generated 20% of their sales last year, and the restaurant was the other 80%. In the store, you can buy gifts and cookware and dinnerware. It generally has this old country aesthetic. It's the old country store. And the food has the same theme. They serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The menu items are generally these hearty, home-cooked type meals, country fried steak and meatloaf and grits. You can get grits there. They also create the whole old country atmosphere. <laughs> There's wood everywhere and fireplaces, rocking chairs, checkerboards. They have these little peg games at the tables. You get the point. And then a few other things about Cracker Barrel that may help give you an understanding of their business. In 2018, average check per guest was $10.48, which is up 2.5% from last year. They serve an average of 6,900 restaurant guests per week. The largest category of items sold in their retail store in 2018 was apparel and accessories, followed by food, decor, toys, and media. They sell an average of 4,100 different items in their store at any given time. And then none of their locations are franchised, meaning the company fully owns every location. The thing that interests me the most is how they attract their customers. Have you ever been driving down the highway and seen one of these signs that says Cracker Barrel, 13 miles away? Well, that's how they get their customers. Unlike any other popular restaurant that I can think of, they're far more interested in attracting the people passing through the town than attracting the people who live in the town. Their largest form of advertising is these signs. They have 1,600 billboards, which makes up one-third of their annual advertising budget. On their website, they predominantly feature this section about tour groups that talks about group sales and group gift cards. There's all these rules about how group sales work. They're clearly trying to attract groups of travelers. 83% of their stores are located along interstate highways, which leads us to how they got started. It involves a man named Dan Evans, who you have to admire his business sense. I'm actually impressed by the entire Evans family. His uncle was a congressman in Tennessee for 15 terms. His grandfather started an oil company, and that's sort of how Cracker Barrel came to be. This was in the late 1960s, when Dan Evans worked for his family's oil company as what's called an oil jobber, which is a very industry specific term. He essentially acted as the middleman between the people who refine the oil and the people who sell the oil. Specifically, there were some shell stations in Lebanon, Tennessee, and he would work to provide them with their gasoline. The issue that these stations were having is that they were in less than ideal locations. See, the newer interstate and highway systems were eliminating traffic from all of the other roads in town. These gas stations that used to serve the locals and the people passing through were now just serving the locals. If you've ever seen the Pixar movie Cars, it's the same thing. So looking at Lebanon, Tennessee for a second, it's not far from Nashville, and it's connected to it by Interstate 40 over here. If you're traveling through the south, Interstate 40 is an attractive option because it connects a lot of the major cities. It's obvious, if you want to build a gas station in Lebanon, Tennessee, do it close to this road. Now, Dan Evans could have done just that, and I would imagine it would be successful, but he started thinking a few steps ahead. There were plenty of other gas stations along the interstate, so how could he make his different? How can he convince drivers to stop at his gas station as opposed to all the others? I think you know where this is going. His idea was to build not only a gas station, but also a restaurant and a gift shop. 
Just think about that. Have you ever been on an interstate? Most of the signs that you see are for restaurants and gas stations, and since most of your customers are travelers, a gift shop just makes sense. Pick up some souvenirs. Also keep in mind, Cracker Barrel isn't exactly the fast food type of restaurant you typically see along the highway, so that further differentiates them from all the other stops. And just a side thought, you also see a lot of signs for motels. He didn't get involved in that, but if Cracker Barrel ever wanted to expand into some Something a little different, that might not be a bad place to look. So that's what he did. He borrowed $40,000 and built it over here on Highway 109 just off Interstate 40. It was a perfect high traffic location and said to be profitable within its first month. Anyone with experience starting a small business should really be able to appreciate that. And it gets more impressive from there. You can tell that Dan Evans was eager to expand the business because after one year he sold a half of it for $100,000 used the money to open a second location. Now, initially, that seems like a strange decision, to sell half the business so quickly, especially since it was so profitable, it wouldn't have taken long to generate the money he needed to expand through the normal course of business. I suspect he did it because he felt the need to act fast, before the competitors either copied his idea or occupied all the good locations along the highways. Or maybe he just wanted to help out some of the other people in town by getting them involved. Most of the early investors were friends of his. But whatever his thought process, it worked. After five years of business, they were up to 10 locations, all of them profitable, and all of them near highways. Early on, they learned that the gas station part of their business was the least profitable, which would make sense to me, being the thing that's most like other businesses. Then, in 1973, there was this massive oil crisis, and it motivated them to start focusing much more on the restaurant and the store, and they eventually phased out the gasoline part of their business altogether. After which, they continued growing without much trouble. In 1981, they became a public company. By 1990, they had almost 100 locations, mostly in the southeast, and $200 million in sales. Then... <laughs> there was a controversy. It was a big one that surprisingly didn't even hurt their sales much. It may have actually helped them. But this video would be incomplete without mentioning this. It's important and it's such a big part of their history. I'm only going to talk about it briefly here and I recommend you learn more about it to get the full story, but this was bad. In 1991, they made it company policy to no longer employ gay people. Right away, the decision was met with massive protests so they quickly changed it, but Holy cow. Dan Evans was still the CEO at the time and supportive of the policy. The whole thing is just crazy. Since I don't want you to think I'm exaggerating anything or putting a personal spin on it, I'll just show you a few parts of articles published around this time. From the Los Angeles Times, the chain recently issued a policy that cited traditional American values and declared that it is perceived to be inconsistent with those of our customer base to continue to employ individuals in our operating units whose sexual preferences fail to demonstrate normal heterosexual values which have been the foundation of families in our society. Oh, that sounds so terrible. From the New York Times, it said it would no longer employ homosexuals and at least nine gay employees were dismissed. Here's a quote from one of the kitchen workers who was fired at that time. They said they didn't really want to fire me because the policy was really aimed at effeminate men and women who have masculine traits who might be working as waiters or waitresses. <laughs> All of this was legal at the time, and as I said, the backlash motivated them to quickly change the policy. I don't want to spend more time on this, it's not the focus of the video, but they've had this type of criticism ever since, and there have been others. Surprisingly, there's really no direct evidence of this hurting the company, sales and profits actually went up through all of this and continued going up from there. Let's get away from that. Throughout the 90s, they started expanding much more aggressively. By 1993, their revenue was nearly two times larger than any other family restaurant. Then in 1995, they hired a new president with the intent of using his experience to further grow the business, which worked because in 1997, they exceeded $1 billion in sales. Looking at them today, on average, they're doing better than the rest of their industry. Over 3 billion in sales, so essentially tripling in size over the past 20 years and generally increasing every year recently. And their income has been going up too. Their comparable store sales have taken a bit of a dive over the past couple years, actually falling into the negative on the retail end, but let's not get too concerned with recent performance. Let's look at the big picture. This is undeniably a successful company, and sure, their success comes from a lot of 
things that you would expect from any restaurant, prices and menu items and service. But more importantly, their success comes from factors that you don't see often. How many industry leading restaurants are found almost exclusively along highways? How many have a strong theme? It's the kind of thing that you would expect to be tacky and fake, but in my experience, I'd say they pull it off pretty well. And how many have a store attached? That's 20% of their business. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of this business? I mean, do you think all these things that make them unique are enough to keep them near the top of their industry? And would you attribute them, like I do, to be the reason that they've made it this far? They've existed for almost 50 years without much trouble, even made it through a terrible controversy almost unaffected. Despite how you feel about them, you have to admit, they've done an impressive job in finding their spot in the industry and maintaining it. You can't say that they're like any other business. So anything else you have to say about them, leave it in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.